Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Nicole Markison, Digital Marketing Manager here at EcoHow. If you've joined us for a previous session in our webinar series, It's Time for Better Wi-Fi, thank you and welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, we hope you find this webinar informative and insightful, and we look forward to having you join future sessions. Before we get started, we have a couple of quick housekeeping items. You are in listen-only mode, so your lines are muted. To submit a question, type your inquiry into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and our subject matter experts will address them during the Q&A session at the end. Today, our team of technical solutions architects has joined us to help field your questions. Today's webinar topic is using spectrum analysis for troubleshooting. Brian Harkins, training and enablement manager here at EcoHow, joins us again to kick us off. Turning it over to you, Brian. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, spectrum analysis is a term that's thrown out a lot in Wi-Fi, and a lot of people have been working in Wi-Fi for several years, just get it and they understand it, but they forget that others don't, and they'll just say, oh, the spec and found this, or the spec and found that, and they don't really explain what it is. So we're going to talk about uh, what spectrum analysis is and how to really use that, that tool to identify and troubleshoot Wi-Fi issues, because even if your network is configured properly, you've got the right number of clients per AP, uh, per radio, you're using the right number of SSIDs, the right power settings, the right plan for where to place the APs. You never know what other sources of non-80211 noise are going to be in your airspace that will disrupt Wi-Fi. And even though it's not the Wi-Fi, it's still a Wi-Fi issue. You've got to troubleshoot it and find out what's causing it so you can mitigate it. So within that, uh, we're going to uh, define spectrum analysis itself. Then we're going to look at spectrum analysis and Wi-Fi. Then we're going to turn it over to Joel Crane, who's going to do a demonstration using uh, EchoHow Sidekick for spectrum analysis. We'll talk about the EchoHow solution, next steps for you to take after today's webinar. And then we'll open up uh, and try to answer as many of the questions that, that we can. Uh, please don't wait till the end to ask questions. In the panel, you can type in your questions as we're going, and we'll try to answer those as we go through, and the ones we can't answer as we go through, we'll try to answer at the end. First, uh, spectrum analysis defined. Wi-Fi works at two layers of the OSI model. Unfortunately, they are the two least intelligent layers, and it's exposed to everyone. Uh, that's layer one, the physical layer, and layer two, the, the data link layer. Now, the data link layer is where we have our MAC addresses and we have uh, logical uh, link controls and things helping the devices talk to each other, know which device is supposed to have that frame and where it came from. But beneath that, layer one, we have just the physical layer, and that's our medium. The medium for Wi-Fi is the air. And, and it's not just Wi-Fi that's out there on the frequencies that we use, on the channels that we select. It could be a lot of things. It could be weather radar, it could be the microwave, it could be cordless phones, it could be a drone flying in the office. You never know what's gonna pop up there in that unlicensed space because it is an unlicensed space. Anybody can make anything to work in that range so long as they're not building it to purposely interfere with someone else's equipment. And you're gonna have to find that. Uh, when you're just looking at layer two, and you're having some problems, you might find a lot of retransmissions and you're wondering why these devices aren't getting um, the data and responding properly with acknowledgements because you've got a great signal strength and you're close to each other, but you still see a lot of retransmissions. You don't know why. It's because you're only looking at one half of where Wi-Fi works. IP addressing and name resolution and everything else is layer three and up. Wi-Fi is just layer one and layer two, and you're only looking at half the problem when you're doing packet analysis. The other half is at the physical layer. Before a device can transmit, it has to make sure that the medium is idle. And if it's listening, looking for another 802.11 signal, it doesn't find one. It assumes the medium is idle, it transmits. But there's noise there. We may have been able to detect the RF energy with the, the radio on the client, but we didn't know what it was. So we assumed that the medium was free for use and we transmitted out there and, and it collided with the noise and the intended receiver never got the frame. So we never got an acknowledgement. That's why you would have a high rate of retransmissions caused by layer one problems. Spectrum analysis is a combination of hardware that's designed to listen at layer one and a software to give you the video or, or visual of what's being reported back. So you can find those, those things and work around them or 
get them out of your space. Sometimes you can't get rid of them. If it's part of a, some medical equipment or maybe some manufacturing equipment that's, that's business critical, you just can't get rid of it. Or maybe it's being caused by a neighbor. Uh, maybe you're near an airport and you've got some weather radar. You can't get rid of the noise always, but you can plan your channel use around that using frequencies that are not being bothered on layer one by that neighboring noise. Spectrum analysis lets you find that noise and start to work around it. So if it's an unlicensed spectrum, that means anybody can be on that channel that you're using and suffer no consequences as long as they're not actually trying to disrupt your signals. Unlike television and radio, where you have licensed frequencies to keep one radio station from interfering with another or one television station from interfering with another, Wi-Fi uses the unlicensed spectrum. And because of that, we're going to have to deal with cordless phones, microwave ovens, uh, X10 surveillance cameras, anything else that works in our space that makes noise that is not 802.11 oriented. All of our devices are going to be looking for 802.11 signaling prior to transmitting to see if the medium is clear, but they're not going to see the noise and realize, oh, there's you know somebody making popcorn or there's an X10 camera on and my frame's not going to get there. It just tries to get there anyway, and the noise stops it. And they're not doing anything wrong by using those devices. Uh, they're doing what they were supposed to do. But since we have such a finite uh, carved out small piece of the spectrum to use for Wi-Fi and 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, compared to all the other license space, we have a lot of devices out there. And certainly 2.4 is very overpopulated with uh, 802.11 devices and Bluetooth and other communications things that need to be there. But then also remote control cars and everything else, cordless phones, the very small devices that have very small battery life, those will be in 2.4 to make use of the fact that 2.4 can transmit greater distances with the same power than five gigahertz, and it's gonna save some battery life. So we're gonna have a lot of things out there that are not Wi-Fi related, but they're in our spectrum in the unlicensed space. With Wi-Fi in our spectrum, the devices try to play with each other. We all try to work things out. We're using collision avoidance versus collision detection because you can't detect a wireless collision. The clients listen to see if it's clear before they transmit. If it is, they transmit. If it's not, they back off because inside the header of every wireless frame is a little window that tells you how long to back off and, and uh, wait. That includes that frame, uh, um, interframe spacing, and the acknowledgement that follows behind that frame. If you hear that, you know how long to wait, but you don't immediately transmit after that. You listen again to see if somebody else is out there. It's kind of like the old, old cartoon with the uh, little chipmunks. No, after you, no, after you, no, after you. And everybody waits and we play well together to try to make that work. And you can see in this uh, image, there are, there's a lot of traffic in different lanes and everybody's together. And we even have a, a couple motorcycles there splitting the lane, making the most out of that face, but they're all working together in a coordinated effort to try to get everyone where they need to go without collisions. This is spectrum analysis with non-Wi-Fi interference. Nobody's working together. It's just out there. You know, my road is built where I need it to go from point A to point B. It's wide enough to take my trucks, my cars, my motorcycles, my ox carts, whatever I've got is, is big enough to take that. But then here comes this flock of sheep across there and they're just, they don't care. They're just uh, out there doing whatever they want to do. And it's not Wi-Fi. It's, so it's just like a noise and it's just out there. So we have to deal with it somehow. Now, if you were driving down this road and that was there, you would have to stop. You're going to stop and wait until that noise goes away. Or you know, if the ground's dry, you might drive around it and get around, work around that noise. Uh, but it just pops up and goes away and pops up and goes away as the sheep go back and forth to graze on different sides of the road. So it may be something like that where it's not always there. Some noise might always be there. If you're near an airport or a marina or near a weather station's uh, radar, you might always have weather radar in your space. Or if you have X10 surveillance cameras in a warehouse, you may always have those 2.4 and you've got to figure out a way to avoid that. Well, how do I know that's there? Well, I'll, I'll see a lot of retransmissions. Normally you'll have users complain. The network is slow, it's your fault. Well, why is the network slow? I'm using the latest and greatest technology on the clients, the latest and greatest on the access points. It's designed properly, but it's still slow. Why? Well, I don't have too many clients per radio. That's not the problem. So you do a frame capture. 
you know, there's a saying, uh, it didn't happen unless there's a YouTube video. And Wi-Fi, the saying is, it didn't happen unless there's a frame capture. So you do your frame capture, and you look, you see a, a lot of retransmissions from the same clients, and you're wondering why they're having a problem. Well, then you, you do some spectrum analysis, and you find out that it's non-Wi-Fi interference. If I were looking at this roadway, and it was just congested with cars like rush hour, then I would know, hey, it's rush hour, this will go away. And I would respect that. I know their cars will all work together. But the sheep, I don't know what's going on with them. I got to figure out a way to get around that noise. So if it's Wi-Fi and it's in 2.4, like an X10 camera, then I'm going to pick a different channel. I'm going to move away from it. And if it's in 5 gigahertz and it's weather radar, I'll turn off the uh, dynamic frequency selections where the weather radar resides and not use those channels. So I'm not exposing my devices to that traffic. Just like if I want to go from point A to point B here, and I know that sheep go back and forth across this road all the time, I might take another road. So spectrum analysis helps us find those things that are going to cause us problems, but they're not Wi-Fi devices doing it. Here are some of the more common uh, non-802.11 interference sources. Everyone always talks about the microwave. Well, it's only the microwave in 2.4 and only when it's turned on. So it's not always there. But it is rather devastating if you're near a, an older microwave or something that bleeds out, something that's not well constructed to contain that, uh, that noise generated by the uh, microwave because they deal in thousands of watts, whereas we're dealing with milliwatts, you know, very limited power compared to a lot of power that's there in that, that microwave. Then you've got, you know, cordless phones. They're, they're frequency hoppers. Uh, so they're going to hop in that 2.4 band or 5 gigahertz band on a range of channels. So they're going to bother you when they land on your channel or land on an adjacent overlapping channel in 2.4, causing overlapping channel interference. Um, the X10 cameras, uh, you lock them on one channel. Playfair, they're not playing like a, a Wi-Fi device would do. They're just constantly streaming video uh, from the camera back to a receiver somewhere, and wireless devices don't know what it is. They just think it's you know clean air and maybe a little RF energy I'll transmit anyway, and they're constantly colliding with that and having some problems. I worked on a project once where we had done five warehouses for people, built them perfectly. Everything was working. Warehouse number six, the exact same blueprint, the same racks everywhere, we, uh, the APs in the same spots, the same clients, but 2.4 gigahertz just was not working. We couldn't figure out what was going on. So I asked the gentleman to do a, a spectrum analysis for me, and we found out that there were X10 cameras there. The security team decided to go with wireless cameras in that warehouse instead of wired cameras. They didn't tell us. So what we did is we moved everything, all of our devices over to five gigahertz to avoid interfering with the cameras and to avoid the cameras interfering with us. You know, weather radar uh, is, is a big problem. That's why we have to use dynamic frequency selection in the Uni2 and Uni2 extended spaces sometimes because these things will sweep around and they'll, they'll trash Wi-Fi. You'll have to change channels. But more importantly, Wi-Fi might interfere with their weather radar. So we have to you know allow all that to be there and work around it by using dynamic frequency selection or not using those channels. Now, if you're deploying uh, five gigahertz uh, voice over Wi-Fi phones, you probably want to turn off the DFS channels anyway, because if there were uh, some type of, of event that triggered a dynamic frequency selection where the AP would tell all the clients the new channel they're moving to, a, a lot of voice calls would drop. So you probably just want to try to avoid those channels. And how do I know to avoid them until there's a problem, right? Well, when you do your survey, you do your physical walkthrough, you're going to do some spectrum analysis during that time period and hopefully find that noise and plan around it ahead of time so the users never have to experience that. Now, if you're not near that and there's no noise, then you can use those channels without much concern. But if you are near that, you want to exclude those from your channel plan. And another one that gets thrown out there at us all the time is, oh, Bluetooth. Bluetooth is in 2.4. It's going to cause me problems. Bluetooth hops 1,500 times per second across the 2.4 spectrum. And it may interfere with me in 2.4 for one 1,500th of a second, and then it goes somewhere else, and then it comes back, and then it goes somewhere else. So it's not a, a huge offender if I'm talking about you know, a few mice and keyboards and head headsets. It's not that big a deal. You have to have a lot of Bluetooth to really um, cause that Bluetooth to rise to the level of an interference source for, for uh, 802.11 transmissions. But you're going to find those sometimes, and people want to blame the Bluetooth. And you can prove that Bluetooth is so uh, little in, in terms of noise that it's not going to bother me unless I have a whole stack of um, 
keyboards turned on at once or somebody streaming you know, video or music with Bluetooth across my AP. At this point, I'd like to uh, turn over to uh, uh, Joel Crane. Joel's gonna be doing uh, a demonstration for us. So Joel, I'm gonna make you presenter, sir. Sounds good, thanks, Brian. Cool, so uh, let's go ahead and take a live look at uh, what spectrum analysis looks like on uh, the Ekahau Sidekick. So let me get that rolling real quick here. All right, hey, perfect. Hey, Brian, can you do me a favor and check? Can you see Ekahau Site Survey and all of its glory there? I, I see, sir. You're, you are displaying your screen. All right, well. perfect. For some reason, GoToMeeting usually does a good job of telling me whether it's working or not, but this time uh, this time it didn't. But good, looks like we're rolling. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I've got an Echo House Sidekick uh, connected to my MacBook Pro. This is live data in our environment right, right now. And I'm just going to show you uh, basically some things that we can see in the spectrum. We've got a couple of good examples for common things that you'll see. Uh, in the spectrum. Now, uh, the Echo House Sidekick is uh, a wearable device that's used for data collection. So this is a device that basically you sling over your shoulder. Uh, it comes with a shoulder strap, so you can basically wear it on your hip uh, with a shoulder strap, and then it connects to your laptop with USB. And this is primarily used to gather site survey data as you perform a site survey in a floor plan. You can also use it to gather real world data in real time, which is what I'm gonna be doing right now. And uh, and then once I'm done with this, I'll pass it over to Jerry for a few minutes and we'll have uh, Jerry show us how you can apply the spectrum analysis to a floor plan and how you can map that data and use that to do things like locate sources of, uh, of interference. But let's go ahead and concentrate on, uh, on this tool first. Now, if you've ever used Ekahau before, then you know that you can pop this up from the bottom here. If I click on this arrow, that's gonna pop up my spectrum analysis view. But if I'm using this as kind of a, a real-time troubleshooting tool, I like to pop it out of Ekahau and make it full screen so I can basically kind of just concentrate uh, on the spectrum and what's going on. Now let's take a look at the different views that we have available to us on the Spectrum Analyzer right now coming from the uh, Echo Sidekick. This view is uh, is basically our density and, and waterfall views. And so right now, this view up here is showing us what is happening in the Spectrum right now. So there's a couple of different things happening. I'm gonna switch over to 2.4 gigahertz just because it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more exciting for, for what's happening right now. Not only does it show us real time data and actually show us what is happening in the environment right now, it's also going to show us a little bit of historical data. And so we can basically look and see uh, we can basically look and see what has happened over uh, over the the last few seconds. So, so uh, unfortunately, the demo gods are not smiling down upon me today. So, give me a second to uh, uh, to sort this one out real quick. So, just take a moment. And also take note that during the whole uh, presentation, you can ask any questions that you might have with the uh, uh, with the question tool, and uh, and we will answer those questions in real time. But we'll also have a dedicated Q and A uh, time uh, at the end where we'll, we'll answer uh, we'll answer some questions verbally. So feel free to take advantage of that. Okay, cool. So now we're looking at the uh, the two point four gigahertz band here, and there's several pieces of of information that we can see. First off is the density view up up uh, on the top. Now I'm going to turn off the density view, and we're just going to focus on the real-time sweep. Now, on, on GoToWebinar, this is probably updating on your screen about once a second. Uh, the Sidekick is a very, very fast spectrum analyzer. It's the fastest spectrum analyzer I have ever seen in the Wi-Fi world. And, uh, and so it's updating on my screen about 20 times a second. So it's super, super quick. The real-time sweep is showing me what is happening, where the RF energy is in the environment right now in real time. So anywhere that you see a spike, that indicates that there is RF energy there right now. Now that energy could be Bluetooth, it could be a wireless video camera, it could be a cordless phone, it could be Wi-Fi, it's all types of energy uh, in the spectrum. Now that line, uh, there's a couple of things that we can tell from it. Basically on the left and right axis, we can tell uh, basically what frequency or what channel that activity is happening on. So for example, over here to the left, that's a lower frequency. Up here on the right, that's a higher frequency. Think of it as just like uh, an audio visualization tool on, uh, on your favorite uh, audio playback tool. There's one that I used to, used to use way back in the day called Winamp. Uh, maybe some of you remember Winamp, good, back in the good old Windows 95, Windows 98 days. 
uh, Winamp had an audio visualization tool in it. So when you played music, it would show essentially a spectrum analyzer, but instead of being for radio spectrum, it was for audio spectrum, specifically the MP3s that you were that you were listening to uh, in Winamp. I see in the questions there's some some shout outs to Winamp. Uh, uh, that's that's awesome. We, we <laughs> Winamp was great. It was a great great tool back in the day. So. So that view is great, but it's kind of hard to keep track of what's going on over time. So I like to enable uh, max density. Now what this does is it gives us a bit of a historical view about what's happened in the spectrum over a set time span. Now I keep mine nice and short at only five seconds. This is a, a very short time frame, but we can boost it all the way up to two minutes if we wanted to. But I'm gonna leave it at uh, five seconds because, uh, because of what I'm gonna demo today. So we can see based on color, how often those specific frequencies are being used. And so if you see uh, something like green, that means that there's very low utilization. Whereas if you see red, that means that there's higher utilization there. If you see black, that means it's very, very high utilization. Utilization meaning that's how often that frequency is being used. So let's have some fun. Uh, if we go to the uh, radios uh, view and we look at the radios, you can see that this is my, my good old uh, AP on the ceiling. It's an older 802.11 NAP. Uh, it's, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. And we can see it uh, right here on channel one. You can see it outlined in blue because that's the access point that I currently have selected. And you can see that there's kind of a flat tabletop shape that's appearing around that access point. Now I've got an old 2.4 gigahertz only client here connected to a throughput testing server. So I'm gonna start a throughput test and let's see what happens in the spectrum while this throughput test runs. You notice that the spectrum here well, it turns red. That's because we are heavily utilizing that channel. That's what Wi-Fi looks like is that flat tabletop shape with the shoulders down each side. If we go to the channels view, we can see exactly how often that channel is being used. It looks like because of our throughput test and all the other devices that are using that channel, we're at about 45 to 50 percent utilization, which means we're using up about half of the available bandwidth, about half of the available time on the channel is being consumed. And so that gives us a good indication of how busy uh, that channel is. Now, if you wanna hide the access points, you can. You can simply switch it to no Wi-Fi access points and those uh, those will disappear. But I typically like to leave, leave them on because I like to combine Wi-Fi scanning with spectrum analysis to get that complete picture of, uh, of what is happening in the spectrum. Now, there's a few other fun things that are happening here uh, that, that I wanna point out. Uh, one of them is uh, all of these really low spikes here. You can kind of see them and they kind of tend to come and go uh, a little bit. All of those low spikes in the spectrum, well, that's kind of an unexpected one. That is an Xbox 360. Uh, only, about, uh, only about 30 feet away from where I am, I've, I've got an old Xbox, and it's crazy to say old at this point, but it, the truth is it's an older console at this point. The Xbox 360 is a frequency hopping, uh, uses a proprietary frequency hopping protocol, so it tends to make a series of small spikes in the spectrum and it seems to kind of come and go it'll turn on for a minute and then it'll go away which it looks like it has now another one that we're seeing some of is uh, my bluetooth mouse and uh, and keyboard uh, you can see this spike right here on channel 11 another one just appeared right next to it and if you look in the waterfall view you can see all of these red dots all over the place you can see all those red dots those are all bluetooth hops from my bluetooth uh, my Bluetooth mouse and keyboard. Uh, another one that's really interesting is I've got some Philips Hue equipment here. Philips Hue is the, the, the cool light bulbs that you can plug in all around your house. Uh, oh, there's some Xbox 360 right there. You can actually clearly see it uh, right there on channel one before the Wi-Fi came back and stomped all over it. Uh, but if you look right here between channels eight and nine, it's very, very faint, but it's there. Uh, that is the Philips Hue equipment, which uses the Zigbee protocol. I believe it's 802.15.4 uh, is the name of the actual protocol, if I remember correctly. So that that uh, that Zigbee protocol is a very low throughput, um, low power protocol. So you could do things like change colors on light bulbs. So for example, I can hit a button on a remote control and change the light bulbs in my house to blue or whatever I want. And since that remote control needs to operate for a very long time on battery power, Bluetooth is a very low power, low utilization protocol. And so while you can see it there, while you can just barely see that it's there, uh, it hardly shows up at all. And that's pretty much on purpose to try to, uh, 
uh, to try to make it conserve as much battery power as possible. So that's some uh, some fun things to look out for in the uh, 2.4 gigahertz band. Let's skip over to the uh, the 5 gigahertz band. Now, for better or for worse, uh, I, I'm presenting this webinar over Wi-Fi today, and uh, and my my friend Mitch, who's listening in on the webinar, he might he might say, "Ooh, that's a that's a bold move, Cotton. We'll see if it pays off." Uh, but, uh, but, but what that's going to do for us is that's going to generate some activity for us in the five gigahertz band. So we can kind of take a look and see what Wi-Fi looks like up in the five gigahertz band. It's no surprise that it looks pretty much the same as, uh, as, as 2.4 gigahertz. I'm, uh, we're, we're getting switched right now. So it'll take me just a moment to get switched up to the, uh, uh up to the, uh, five gigahertz band. Uh, but we're going to see a couple of interesting things uh, when we get up there. Well, first off, we'll see what Wi-Fi looks like on a 40 megahertz wide channel. And we'll also get the opportunity to look at a spy camera, a small camera uh, that works in the uh, in the five gigahertz band. So we'll give uh, we'll give it uh, just a, a moment to finish loading here. Keep in mind, if you have questions, feel free to ask those at any time. Uh, using the uh, using the question tool, we've had lots of great questions come in, and uh, we'll either answer those on the fly via text, and we'll pick some out at the end that we can that we can get answered uh, answered uh, verbally as uh, as well. Hey Brian, while uh, while I'm getting things ready for the demo, on the other hand here on the other end of things here, do you have any uh, uh, do you have any good examples of things that you've seen in the five gigahertz band? Like, uh, didn't you have a cool recording of a uh, of an eighty megahertz wide channel? I do, sir. If you will make me presenter, I will uh, um, show that. I'll just take me a moment to, to get there. Okay, sure. Uh, why don't you, uh, while I get this ready, why don't you uh, try to get set up for that? And as soon as you're ready, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and make you uh, presenter. Okay, you can go ahead and make me presenter if you like, sir. Perfect. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, so this is a, a capture of a four by four by four access point and a four by four by four client using an 80 megahertz wide channel passing a 350 meg file. Let me play that again for you. You can see the base channel in use. And then when the file starts transferring, you see all four of channels being used. And if you look closely in between the channels where there would normally be space due to the guard interval, you actually use that when you're using the bonded channels. So we're using all of that space. And if anywhere on one of those channels, a noise were there, that would impact the throughput and you wouldn't be able to get the speeds that you were supposed to get with the 802.11 AC uh, protocol. So you, anywhere, if there were noise uh, there, it could be uh, another device and, and five gigahertz that's a legitimate device trans transmitting and you would drop off of a channel or it could just be some narrow band interferer. And one of the things I really love about uh, looking at, at visualizations through uh, Sidekick is that when you're, you're looking at them, you're able to see uh, all the little tiny lines on each channel. Let me play it again. All these little lines coming up on each channel, those are the subcarriers. If there's a noise on one subcarrier, it may not kill your transmissions, but it's definitely going to impact the channel that is using that, that subcarrier and it's gonna degrade your performance because of the noise there. I'm just amazed at four by four by four and an 80 meg channel passing a 350 meg file that fast because I'm old and I started on punch cards. And I remember when uh, having a computer, a desktop with one meg of RAM was huge and uh, a five meg hard drive. I'm thinking, why do you need a five meg hard drive when you have a whole stack of floppies right here? So uh, 350 megs going that quickly to me is, is, is amazing. And it may not be amazing to people who've grown up with it, but to me, seeing it fly through that quickly is, is pretty cool. And as a Wi-Fi guy, seeing four channels, having data move that quickly, it means that whoever that user is, they're on and off the network that much faster, and the next person can get there, uh, unless there's some noise. You know, if there's some noise there taking out a channel, that's going to impact your data rates, and you won't get the, uh, the wonderful three gig data rates that AC is supposed to offer us. So that's a, a really neat video. Um, and if anybody uh, anybody wants it, just shoot me an email at the end of the presentation. I'll email you the video. Perfect. Thanks for that, Brian. Much appreciated. Uh, you. Yeah, go ahead and make me presenter again. I'll pass the ball over to me. I'm uh, I'm going to show uh, I'll show that camera here as well. So this isn't quite as impressive as a 40 megahertz or as an 80 megahertz wide channel, but this is a this is what a 40 megahertz wide channel looks like. Uh, 
uh, on the uh, Ekahau Sidekick in the Spectrum Analyzer. So uh, since I've got an older 802.11n access point, then uh, I don't get 80 megahertz channels. I only get the option for uh, basically bonding two 20 megahertz channels together to form a 40 megahertz channel. So you can see that there. And if we switch this to the full waterfall view, it's kind of fun. This view down here shows us uh, what's happening over a rolling time span. Uh, basically, the color intensity shows us how loud it is. And so if you see red, that means there was something there that happened really close by or was pretty loud. Whereas if you see kind of that yellow or green, that means that there was activity there. But it was a little bit, uh, a little bit further, uh, further away. And what's kind of fun to look at this is this is what I'm using right now. I mean, this is carrying my voice. This is carrying these images, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, it's kind of fun. And if we go look at the channels view, well, we're only using about four, four three to four percent utilization. Uh, kind of to Brian's point there, the reason for that is because first off, I'm really, really close to my access point. We're at about sitting at about negative 43 dBm, so it's really close. And because of that, my laptop can talk really, really fast. And so it can get on the air and get off the air really, really quickly. And that way we're able to uh, to keep our actual channel utilization really, really low. It doesn't look as cool as the example that Brian showed. So thanks, Brian. It's just <laughs> odd to have a four by four by four client station. And, and complete, Absolutely. Tra complete transparency, that's the first one I've ever seen. And it was in a desktop because to put a four by four by four radio and a mobile device would just suck the battery life out of it so quickly. I, I've seen one for a laptop or a handheld yet. Just, just that, that one in, in the, uh, the. Yeah, it's kind of a rare one to see for sure. Uh, typically as much as we, as, as uh, I ever see is three by three on a, uh, you know, like a premium laptop or maybe a desktop Wi-Fi adapter, but four by four, that's uh four, four antennas, four, uh, four uh, radio chains all in one chipset. But that's uh, there's a lot of horsepower there. So, Okay, so let's take a look at a uh, a non-Wi-Fi a non device up in the five gigahertz band. This is actually something Jerry hooked me up. So props to Jerry for hooking me up with this cool little spy camera. This thing is tiny. Uh, it's just uh, the, the PCB on this. It's a bare PCB, and it's only uh, oh shoot, it's only like uh, three centimeters deep and a couple centimeters wide tops with a a tiny little 100 milliamp hour battery that'll run for actually a very long time. So if we plug it in, it's not going to take you very long to see where it is. And you could even see it tune itself and kind of kind of pick a channel. If you look closely, well, you shouldn't have to look closely at all at this point. You can see this shape on channel 149. So let's zoom in on that to get a little bit closer look at what's going on. Here's one zoom level in so far. Uh, if we scroll down and look at the channels that it's on, we can see that on average, it's eating up, it's causing about 33% utilization on channel 149. Uh, so let's zoom in a little bit closer so you can see exactly what that looks like. Now, right now, it's got a lens cap on it. So it's literally just transmitting blank audio or not blank audio, but, you know, video rather. So if I take the lens off of it and now it's actually moving a bunch of data, you can see the signature changes. This is a classic, classic uh, example of an old analog video camera. While this is a fairly new camera, it's using old analog techniques. And so it makes, this is what I would call a narrow band signature. It's not frequency hopping like Bluetooth, like Brian talked about earlier, uh, but it's a narrow band signature, more similar to, uh, uh, to uh, like a cordless phone or other types of video cameras, or even that Zigbee device that you could just barely see in the spectrum is another form of uh, of narrow band. So, so that's just some examples of things you can see uh, in the environment, in the spectrum, when you're actually looking at this stuff um, on a spectrum analyzer. One more thing to point out before we pass it over to Jerry to talk about how we can apply what we've learned here to the mapping portion of Ekahau. You can see on the waterfall view when I plugged this device in and it started to transmit, if we go ahead and disconnect the power from it, then you can immediately see in the waterfall view where it stopped transmitting. So that's part of uh, that's part of how the waterfall view and the density view work together is that the waterfall view gives you that nice historical look at what ha was happening over time. And there uh, there you can see it uh, plugged, plugged in uh, once more. So, okay, well, uh, at this time, uh, I think I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Jerry to talk about how we can uh, apply this to a mapping scenario. All right. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, take the ball here. And I've got a survey uh, that I performed recently using the sidekick. So let's take a look at uh, what we can do with those results, right? So, so far, we've talked about a lot of live spectrum analysis and did some demos with that, uh, which can be great for kind of on the spot troubleshooting. 
but also from a survey standpoint, you know, that's really what the sidekick is is ultimately built for, right? Is speed for surveying. So having that really uh, fast spectrum analyzer is going to be a big value for a survey. So for example, in this uh, small survey project that I completed recently, um, you'll actually see this was, you know, a pretty minimal amount of time spent. So if we go to the survey statistics here, this total survey I spent less than five minutes doing, and we'll see even under five minutes, I can gather, I was able to gather a lot of information about the RF environment and even enough detail that I can isolate uh, where these signals, where the sources of the energy came from as I just made a single pass through this building. So using the three radios on board the sidekick, the two passive plus the spectrum analyzer and my internal radio, I'm able to gather a, a ton of information about the RF environment and kind of dissect that uh, to, you know, to help me understand what's going on here, maybe identify, you know, the source of an issue. Um, so right now we're on the traditional signal strength view, uh, but we can slice this in a number of different ways, like I said, and since this focus is on the spectrum side, I'm going to focus on the visualizations that are just isolating that raw RF energy data that we're uh, pass it, that's going to be passed along from the sidekick. So the first one we could look at here is the spectrum channel power. Uh, what this is going to do is allow us to look at that raw RF energy um, and, and identify if there's any high sources of energy, um, you know, if there's any you know, significant spike. So the way I like to set this view up um, is uh, change it to more of like a hot to cold kind of scheme. So I like to use the number two option here. And I'm going to adjust these sliders so we get a nice hot to cold uh, view. So we can adjust these DBM sliders here. And what I'm trying to do is really crop out anything that's going to be for sure not Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi, you know, it's pretty low power, low output out of these access points. So what I'm doing is I'm saying anything that's, you know, typical Wi-Fi kind of output power range, which is going to be around negative 30 and up, um, you know, flag those areas as red, as these kind of hot spots. And now we can kind of get a good picture of that. Let's actually turn off some of these other layers like the survey so we can get a better uh, visual here. So yeah, now we can see, okay, we've got a couple of areas where we saw some really high uh, energy. And if I hover my mouse over here, it's gonna give me a little tool tip here on the spectrum channel power. So in this particular area, we were seeing uh, energy detected at negative 18, uh, negative 20 to negative 18 dBm. We saw negative 18 on channel 132. If I hover my mouse over here and it uh, looks like it's labeled as Office 2, we also see another hot spot over here uh, on channel 153, um, this one all the way up to negative 15 dBm. So now if I go to my visual options, we can really uh, you know, start to drill down into that and maybe I want to focus in on that channel 153, for example, and uh, isolate, you know, all, you know, filter out all the rest of the channels and just show me that to get an cl even clearer picture of where the source of that energy is coming from. And we can even further, you know, reduce the spacing count um, to get a better uh, understanding of kind of the contour lines here and see where that signal is generating from. And now we have a very clear picture, right? So a common question I get is, you know, how can I use a spectrum analyzer to identify, you know, where this interfering device is, um, you know, what in, what the interfering device is. So these are some of the ways that we can, you know, isolate that at least physically in the building, you know, where that energy is radiating from. Um, so now we can dive into the survey data itself and get a better picture from just like Joel was showing before using that real-time frequency monitor view. We can play that back the same way we were looking at live in a post-survey uh, manner as well. So let's zoom back in on the survey here a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start kind of further out where the signal was a little you know, weaker. And we are looking at channel 153. So I'm going to zoom in on that on the spectrum here. And you can see right now, the signal's not real strong. There's something going on here in channel 153 that definitely does not look like Wi-Fi. And there's a little jog dial here, the slider, that we can actually slide to the left or the right along the time scale. And we can really play back the survey and watch the spectrum over time here. And how, as we get closer to the source of that energy, how the spectrum's changing and what that's doing uh, from an energy and power standpoint. Now you can see, the power on the center frequency is so strong that the in, in echo we have it kind of set to just visualize up to negative 25 and you can see it's actually off the charts so that output energy out of this uh, interfering source was so strong that it's actually off the charts here so this is another one of these kind of video transmitters like joel was talking about before but this one's much higher power than the one that uh, joel was just showing and uh, yeah it could be pretty devastating not only to you know this channel 153 that it's near 
but also it's going to cause some impact to some of the uh, the neighboring channels uh, by it as well. We can see there's some utilization, actually even higher utilization on channel 149 here, um, but we're also seeing some utilization on 157. Um, so you can see there's quite a few channels that are being impacted. Well, I think that's a, a pretty, you know, there's a lot of other things that we can dive into, but for the sake of time and just seeing how many questions and stuff we have coming in, um, we'll open it up to the, uh, the Q&A side now, and then uh, we can maybe dive into a couple more examples uh, if you guys uh, have, uh, have some questions on some other scenarios that you want to look at. I'll go Perfect. ahead and get the uh, questions pane pulled up. And uh, yeah, Joel, did you have uh, some questions that you saw come in that we want to address? I'll go ahead and take some of these. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, read off some of these questions. And Brian and Jerry, I'll throw these at you and uh, and get your take on these. Either one of you can jump in and answer some of these. Uh, and uh, and then we'll, we'll just kind of go from there. So. Uh, and oh, shout out to Charlie Dean for bringing up uh, Winamp2 dot, or Winamp2 JS. I saw that a few days ago. That was just uh, uh, that was uh, uh, just uh, that was a good one. So, uh, qu great question from Steve here. And uh, Steve, this is a question that's really near and dear to my heart. Is the term utilization synonymous with duty cycle? I'm going to leave that one to Jerry and Brian because I'd actually like to get your guys' opinion on this one. I'm so glad you asked that one, Joel, because I actually had that one highlighted myself. Nice. <laughs> I love that question. Uh, duty cycle and utilization are, are different, uh, but they, they impact us in a very similar way. So that's people think they're the same. I, I would uh, equate duty cycle with um, the strength at which somebody is utilizing the space. Is that is that a fair assessment, guys? The utilization is how often I'm using it, how much of it I'm grabbing but the duty cycle is how strong I am when I'm grabbing it. So if I, I can have somebody who's off at a great distance, they're gonna have a very low duty cycle. So they're not really gonna impact me that much. Somebody who's really close, uh, they're gonna have a stronger signal. And if they're not using the air a lot, they're still not gonna bother me that much. But if they're close and they're using the air a lot, they're really gonna hurt me. So th they both impact me. Uh, I think they're two parts of the same issue rather than being one thing. Is is that fair, guys? I'd like to get Jerry's take on this one, uh, uh, if you want to, Jerry, not to throw you under the bus or anything. But uh, do you have any opinions on that? <laughs> That's Jerry's um, job to throw I people mean, under the bus. Don't encroach on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Brian. It's um, you know they're they're kind of one and the same, right? Um, but um, you know the other, you know, even third one to that is you know you hear it referred to as like airtime utilization. Um, so there's the, you know, uh, how much airtime is being consumed um, versus, you know, how, uh, how, con how, how consumed versus available it is, right? So we have the available side of things and then we have the busy side of things. And that's essentially what we're looking at is the percentage of time that that medium is occupied or that particular channel is occupied versus available for um, a, a radio to transmit on it. I'll give my opinion here too before we move on, and this is strictly my uh, opinion. You know, I, I I could easily be wrong about this one. I always like to think of, and every uh, most tools out there kind of handle this differently. So you know, don't take this as uh, don't take this as the one all be all answer. This is just kind of how I see it. In my mind, uh, uh, duty cycle tends to refer to how often a specific device is talking versus not talking, right? I mean, right now, my voice, the duty cycle of my voice is pretty high. It's about 80% right now, uh, whereas uh, Brian's voice is 0% right now because he's not saying anything. Whereas I see utilization as kind of being the sum of all of the activity on a frequency or, or on a channel, right? If Brian and I both started talking at the exact same time between, you know, him talking, uh, his duty cycle being 80%, and my duty cycle being 80%, you know, we're going to fill up to 100% utilization on that channel. That's just my opinion. I don't know. I, and I, I think I think there's several different ways. I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer on that one. So any more comments on that one, guys, before we move on? So this is a common question that goes along with that is, um, you know, so, yeah, we talk about these percentages of channel utilization, duty cycle, however we want to refer to it. What is the uh, acceptable amount of, you know, percentage of utilization, right? So, um, yeah, what do you guys think as far as Joel, Brian, 
do you have certain rules of thumb that you apply to certain scenarios of you know certain types of applications, things like that? Um, what, how do you kind of correlate that percentage of utilization to the health of the spectrum? I'll throw a number out there. Uh, once I see, uh, and I want to get Brian's take on this, once I hit about 50% utilization, uh, especially if I'm doing voice over Wi-Fi, I'm really going to start getting concerned. That's where it's like, ooh, that's really pushing that channel pretty hard. Brian, any thoughts on that? That, that's where I look at it because you're already dealing with a half duplex medium and all kinds of extra overhead. So you're really only getting not even half of, of what the advertised data rate is. You're getting sometimes 35, 40% of the advertised data rate. And when you have 50% time utilization, you need to start looking at breaking those collision domains into smaller pieces, adding more APs, different channels, uh, things of that nature to, to uh, calm it down some. But 50% is my number as well. Cool. Yeah, so I would add to that. I've done a lot with um, with voice over Wi-Fi type deployments. So that's where you know that I had to really kind of understand these percentages and where things break down. So yeah, from an application standpoint, real time services like a voice over Wi-Fi is definitely going to start to break down around that fifty percent. Because if you think about it, that means fifty percent of the time the medium is busy, and that client or that transmission has to defer its communication and wait for the medium to become available. So real-time applications break down around 50%. Um, now data is more resilient, right? If you're just trying to load some, you know, send a file, download a, you know, uh, an attachment or um, load a web page, you know, that can sustain uh, definitely some more delays in, in busier medium, you know, more up to about 70 to 80% is where, you know, it's still going to work, but it might take a little bit longer. But from a uh, end user standpoint, you know, it's still going to be a fairly decent experience for data. Um, but yeah, once you start, you know, breaking that 70, 80 percent utilization on the channel, bad things are going to start to happen, right? Pages aren't going to load. People are going to get disconnect, get disconnected. You're going to have a, a bad uh, client experience for sure. You're going to have a bad time. Uh, a, uh, a great question from Andrew uh, that I, I, I answered this one in text, but I kind of want to bring it up again and talk about it because I think it's a really great question. He says, in a public library with about 200 PCs across five floors with an atrium building design, all with Bluetooth turned on, will Bluetooth affect things in this case? That's a great question, uh, Andrew. Here's the thing to keep in mind about Bluetooth. One Bluetooth device, it's basically just clapping all over the place. It's just clap, 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 clap all over the spectrum. It's not going to interrupt Wi-Fi for a significant amount of time on a channel, but 200 of them in one space, things, depending on what they're doing, what those Bluetooth devices are doing, things could get out of control pretty quickly. Uh, one of my good friends in the industry, Jim Florwick, he's a great guy. Uh, he has a, a really nice, a really great story that I'm going to steal from him and tell here, where he saw an environment where there were a couple of hundred uh, Bluetooth devices that were battery powered on pallets in a warehouse. And they were set to go into discoverable mode at a regular interval. So like every 15 minutes or so, several hundred of these devices would all wake up all at once and go into discoverable mode and just completely knock out uh, the 2.4 gigahertz band. And then they'd all go silent again and everything would start working just fine again. Uh, ultimately, the lesson to be learned from that is that one Bluetooth device, you're not even going to notice it. There's not going to be a perceptible impact to performance at all. But if you get a lot of devices that are in discoverable mode or a lot of devices streaming high quality uh, audio, uh, that can get uh, problematic uh, pretty quickly. Uh, Brian, Jerry, any comments on that one? It just takes a lot. It takes an awful lot. I've seen um, uh, 80211 devices, uh, 129 connected to one AP, but they were barcode scanners in a logistics warehouse and they were just sitting in the charger. You know, being connected and is different than actually doing something. You've got a whole pallet full of uh, Bluetooth keyboards trying to find uh, something to connect to. That's going to be a lot of noise. The the noise floor in that space probably went from about neg 90, neg 95 up to about neg 70 pretty quickly. And that's going to dramatically impact the data rates that the devices there are able to use. So that that's a, a, a big problem when, when it reaches that level. I would say on on uh, average daily use, Bluetooth is not that big a deal for Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi is stronger uh, and there's just not that much of the Bluetooth. And, and again, it's a frequency hopper. So by design, it's supposed to bounce around to create as little interference as possible and to receive as little interference as possible. So unless you do have that scenario where it's just everything piled together or streaming music or something right across the AP, I don't think Bluetooth is really going to bother us that much. Great. Thanks, Brian. 
Uh, another great question uh, from John is, can spectrum analysis sessions be recorded in Ekahau? Uh The answer is yes. And I'm actually, let me show you, uh, let me show you a recording that I actually took. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is actually just a couple months ago uh, with that, that same Xbox 360 that, that we were, uh, that we were talking about earlier. So basically what this is, is this is a, this is just a bogus project file. I, I loaded a map in there just to make the software happy and to give it a map. Normally you're gonna have this tied to a map, right? In this case, I just wanted to get a cool example of something. Uh, this is a, a spectrum analysis recording of an Xbox 360 with, uh, with some controllers turned on. And you can see, see this narrow, all these narrow spikes in the spectrum here. Uh, that is all, uh, that's all like, I think I had three Xbox 360 controllers on and uh, mashing buttons on them so they're all transmitting something. And that's the signature that they made. Curiously, it's about a 20 megahertz wide area, but they're hopping from channel to channel to channel to channel. And so that's just an example uh, to answer the question. Yes, it does do recordings. And that is an example of, uh, of what those uh, recordings can look like. I have a good one. And I kind of want to you know give Jerry a nice one because he was so kind to me last week with that throw me under the bus question. But you know, this is a fair one. Uh, What's the spectrum utilization maximum uh, for Wi-Fi to operate correctly? And that's a question from Juan. It's all you, Jerry. Well, didn't didn't, uh, didn't we pretty well cover that? I mean, I guess we touched on it a little bit. But we can talk about it a little bit more as far as the I, I percentage think they're looking goes. For a number. I, I don't know that there's an actual number out there for noise because it really depends on on so much stuff. A number for noise? Oh, not for like percent utilization. Yeah, what what's the, spe misunderstood the, the question. spectrum utilization for Wi-Fi to still work properly? And we said fifty percent uh, of of airtime utilization. But I believe this, this one's also just looking at noise in the airspace as well. Yeah. So from a uh, so yeah, I thought we were talking about spectrum utilization before. So maybe I uh, misunderstood the previous question. But yeah, eighty percent is typically what I look at. Is you know that that max kind of utilization Wi-Fi is going to break down. Um, at around that 80% altogether. So 50% for supporting voice over Wi-Fi in real-time applications, um, you know, between the 50 and around 70%, data is still gonna flow, um, you know, from the client's, you know, uh, experience, they're probably not gonna really notice much different, you know, web pages may take an extra second to load or something, but um, it's still gonna work. Once you get above that 70%, you know, you're gonna start to really notice the Wi-Fi is running slow, and then, um, you know, you get, you get get to that 80% or so, things are gonna to start to break down. I think when you look at uh, utilization, including noise, not just the wireless devices, uh, for me, it's more about getting the wireless signal the correct uh, percentage above the noise floor. You know, for devices to access their higher data rates, most chipset vendors want at least a neg 70 signal strength on the client side. But if my noise level goes from a standard noise floor of like 95, suddenly up to 85, that neg 70 now becomes neg 55. So you also have to look at your, your noise floor because it is taking up airspace. So I think that, that may be what, where we're going with the, the spectrum analysis piece of that. I, I apologize if I didn't read it properly, but I just want to look at the, the noise, including uh, that generated by Wi-Fi for everything in the channel that's affecting you. You just have to keep bumping your power up as the noise floor goes up to contend with it. Or once you find the noise and if you can't get rid of it, change channels like we talked about earlier. Here, here's an evil so one. Saw one question uh, in here. What, what, uh, how can you tell which device is that from a, a frequency spike? It's just from tracking that type of device down in the past and realizing what it is. Uh, you, you'll see di different things have different signatures. Uh, so it, you'll, you'll uh, find microwaves and you'll know what they are from seeing it before. And the same with the X10 cameras. And you know, obviously the ones we've done and shown you we created the noise, so we knew what it was. So when you find that uh, noise the first time, you may want to screenshot it and put a little note, this is this kind of device. So when you see it again, you'll know what it is. It just take, takes quite a while to, to find it. I've been doing it for about 18 years. So it's it's a, just a, something you see over and over, but look for something to make that easier coming soon. It is, uh, uh, it is very tricky and it's definitely an art to read a spectrum analyzer. Uh, and so, you know, one thing I'd recommend doing is keep your eyes on a spec and as much as you can. 
Uh, you know, I mean, I, I take my spec hand with me everywhere and I'm always like looking, Ooh, what's in the spectrum here? You know, I'm always kind of hunting around. I'm kind of backwards from a typical wireless engineer because I'm always looking for, you know, I'm, I'm excited when I see interference, you know, most people go, Oh, great. There's interference. We got to deal with it. I'm backwards. Cause I'm not actually responsible for a network. I, you know, I just, uh, am excited to find something that causes interference. Uh, another way to, to figure out what it is, is also, like Jerry showed you earlier, getting it onto a map. When you actually conduct a site survey and you keep an eye on the spectrum analyzer and you see a spike or some kind of shape there, you go, that's not right. That doesn't look like Wi-Fi at all. Uh, then uh, that's when you use that mapping function to actually narrow down where that thing is located. And that's when you start looking around, poking around, going, okay, what in here is wireless? And if you keep an eye on the uh, the real-time frequency monitor and you start unplugging stuff or powering things on and off, you can you can figure out which which thing is transmitting pretty fast. Uh, just look for anything that, uh, that, that might be wireless. And if you're working with an external customer or something like that, you know, you might need to ask like, hey, what, what wireless devices do you have here? You know, rack your brain. Are there anything here, anything that, that uses wireless anything somehow? And uh, they might be able to help you hunt it down as well. But I would agree with Joel on the, uh, you know, look at the spectrum as much as you can. Um, if, so if you want to learn to do spectrum analysis, I think that's key, right? So the more you look at it in the spectrum of good Wi-Fi, I think is the important piece, and that's the often overlooked piece, is most people get the spectrum analyzer out when there's problems, right? And that's the first time they use the spectrum analyzer, and then they don't know what they're looking at, right? So you need to get a good baseline and understand what is the spectrum supposed to look like, you know, when Wi-Fi is performing properly. So that way, when it's not performing properly, you can clearly differentiate between, okay, this is what it's supposed to look like. Here's the things that are sticking out to me that are not supposed to be here. Um, and it makes it that much easier. If you only look at the spectrum when there's problems, you know, that's where it's going to be really hard to differentiate, you know, what's happening in that environment. Uh, we've got a few more questions here. Uh, um, some, some great questions. One from, uh, one here that I really like, what about rogue devices such as a Google Chromecast or a Microsoft Miracast in a high density area such as a big classroom? Would they impact performance? That is a great question. Now, obviously, uh, when you're streaming video to those, yeah, that is going to impact performance. But you know what? Fortunately, that's what the Wi-Fi is there for is, uh, you know, to, to move data around for us. And so you will see heightened utilization when you when you're streaming video to something like a a Chromecast or or something like that, uh, the the tricky part about that is something like a Chromecast. I've noticed that a Chromecast likes to sit there and beacon all the time. Here is the case in point. Uh, you'll see in orange. You can see in orange there. That is my 40 megahertz wide uh, access point right there. Right. So we're using two 20 megahertz wide channels together to make a 40. If you look closely, there's another flat tabletop shape in, uh, it's kind of a gray line right here on channel 36. Uh, that particular device, that's actually uh, that's actually a Chromecast. And uh, if you look up this MAC address, it's not broadcasting an SSID. You could call this a hidden SSID. Uh, if you look up that MAC address, that actually belongs to my Google Chromecast here. Um, and so uh, as far as performance impact, it's gonna be pretty minimal. Uh, you know, the Chromecast is sitting there beaconing. It's basically saying, hey, I'm I'm an access point. I'm here. And it just does that every 102.4 milliseconds, every 10 times a second or so, right? Uh, so that is going to consume a tiny bit of airtime, uh, but it's not going to be super detrimental to the performance um, of your network. Um, I lost in the list here, but there was another great question about using multiple SSIDs. Uh, each one of those SSIDs, just like the Chromecast sitting here beaconing, does introduce its own management overhead. So watch out for that. Uh, there's a, a great calculator out there uh, by Andrew Von Nage at revolutionwifi.com. That's revolutionwifi.com. Uh, he has got a calculator that shows uh, how how much airtime individual SSIDs use. And if I remember correctly, once you hit about eight SSIDs, you will consume pretty much all of your own airtime uh, in an enterprise environment with just your own uh, your own management overhead. So, uh, Brian, Jerry, any more questions that you see that we have time for before we uh, wrap it up for the day? You know, there's a ton of great questions in here, but I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I know we're already about 15 minutes over. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if we've got that uh, slide pulled up with everybody's uh, contact info. If we can maybe get that pulled up, Brian, 
And uh, that way, if uh, you know there's still quite a few people on here, if we weren't able to get to your question, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, you know Brian, Joel, or myself, and uh, we'd be happy to schedule 30 minutes or whatever, and uh, you know go over any of those specific topics that uh, we weren't able to get to. So Brian's putting up all of our uh, contact information here. If you want to learn more about uh, Echo House Site Survey, uh, then uh, then feel free to schedule a demo with us. You can basically get on our uh, you can basically get on our our website, and there is a, a demo button there that you can press, and that will connect you with either uh, Stephen uh, over in APAC or uh, Nick over he's uh, in the UK or myself. We would be more than happy to uh, to give you a one-on-one -on -one demo of the software and answer any questions that that you might have, uh, or you can also request a free evaluation uh, copy, which will allow you to test drive the software, uh, especially the uh, the capability to do virtual network design, which we which while we didn't cover today, uh, we'll definitely be covering in an upcoming webinar. Uh, Jerry and uh, Brian, any any final comments before we hand it over to Nicole to close out the webinar? No more, no, I, nothing I, else I for me. Not. All right, perfect. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and hand it back over to Nicole to uh, to close out the webinar. Great, thanks, Joel, and uh, thanks so much, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Um, as uh, Joel mentioned, if you have any other questions, you can please uh, feel free to contact the team directly. You'll also receive a follow-up email within two business days with a link to a recording of today's session. And on behalf of Eckhouse, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.